We are drawn to stories about the missing. We want to find meaning, but none can be found because tragedy defies reason. We are trying to understand, however, there are some cases that cannot be understood, not completely. There are countless disappearances in the national park system of the United States. There's no way of knowing how many have vanished because there's no central database or registry to track their cases. And without a unified index, it's difficult to identify patterns, make connections, and find resolution. Within weeks, search efforts begin to wane and media attention fades. The names of those who have gone missing are spoken by fewer and fewer people until their name is joined to a litany of other names, those who have gone missing. Some conservatively estimate that at least 1,600 people have vanished on public lands and remain missing under unexplainable circumstances. One of the leading civilian researchers, David Politis, began to research these disappearances. He attempted to identify and exclude cases that could be explained by animal predation, mental illness, criminality, or voluntary disappearance. Then he examined the remaining outlier cases and discovered that they shared uncanny and unexplained commonalities. These shared characteristics became known as the missing 411. These profile points have changed over the years, so the following is a composite summary. Victims who go missing are usually on either extremes of the intellectual spectrum, ranging from the highly intelligent to those who are struggling with mental disabilities. Victims who go missing are usually on either extremes of the physical spectrum, ranging from the very fit and active to those who are disabled or sedentary. Disappearances often occur in the mid to late afternoon, and they also occur in geographical clusters. Severe and inclement weather coincides with the disappearance or the beginning of the search. Victims go missing near large bodies of water, boulder fields, or berry bushes. If the victim is recovered, they have no memory or they have surreal narratives to explain their disappearance. Their causes of death are often undetermined. Bodies are frequently recovered in areas that have been thoroughly searched by search and rescue teams. Similarly, the search and rescue teams will be unable to find any tracks, or if tracks are found, they somehow vanish mid-path. Canine units will be unable to pick up a scent, or they will not pursue the scent if found. One or both shoes are missing from recovered bodies. Similarly, bodies are recovered in areas that are difficult, if not impossible, to reach, especially in the time elapsed. The following are three select cases. This is Volume 2 of Missing 411 National Park Disappearances. David Horsey and Frederick Hardesty went camping on the North Nahanni River in the Northwest Territories of Canada on June 12, 2005. The two friends traveled to the area on a wilderness hunting trip, and they stayed 125 kilometers north of Fort Simpson. They were described as experienced bushmen, comfortable in the rugged outdoors. They were set to explore the Nahanni Park Reserve, which was christened in 1976. Its name comes from the indigenous language of the Dene people, who occupied the area for thousands of years. Their oral history contains many references to the Naha tribe, which means the people over there. The Naha lived in the mountains and regularly descended into the lowlands on raids. However, it's been recorded that these people mysteriously and abruptly vanished from the area. 
Geographically, the reserve contains part of the Mackenzie Mountains and Virginia Falls. It is largely composed of backcountry terrain, thousands of square miles that have been largely unexplored. Even now, some areas remain accessible only by air, water, or arduous hiking. Rod Gunderson, a mutual friend, offered his cabin to Horsey and Hardesty, and when he left them on June 12th, both men were still alive. Four days later, he noticed smoke from small fires as he returned to find the two men missing. When he tried the doors to the cabin, he found they were locked. Inside, it was still well supplied with food and firewood. Concerningly, the men had left their firearms behind. On June 18th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were called to investigate. They could find no reason for why the men had abandoned the security of the cabin without their firearms. Search teams were called to the area and they focused their efforts on the Nahanni River. They employed canines and aerial search units equipped with thermal imaging, and their search continued until June 23rd with no results. Joseph Horsey, David's stepbrother, participated in the search party, and he claimed to have found strange things at the Gunderson cabin. He told reporters, quote, there were bullet shots all over the place, and there was a gunshot in the floor, unquote. The search operation was continued by friends and family, and on June 27th, David Horsey's body was found in thick brush. A corporal of the RCMP, Al Shepard, confirmed that the area had already been well searched several times. Strangely, Horsey's body was found with burns on his hands and arms. The search was initiated again, and the authorities returned with canine units on July 5th. On July 8th, a search team found Hardesty floating in the Nahanni River, nearly 20 kilometers away from the cabin. This area had already been combed by searchers in canoes and on foot. After autopsy, Horsey was determined to have died of hypothermia and Hardesty had drowned. This case fits several of the missing 411 profile points. The two men were in good physical condition, as they were avid outdoorsmen. The victims went missing near the Nahanni River, which became the focus of the search efforts early on. Both bodies were recovered in areas that had already been thoroughly searched. Despite the remote location, the men had left no trail exiting the cabin. And although search teams had explored the areas where bodies had been found, canine units never uncovered their scent. On September 13th, 2013, Joe Elliott Blakesley and Amy Linkert traveled to the Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho, located in the Snake River Plain. It's one of the youngest volcanic areas in Idaho, and it contains the best preserved flood basalt area in the continental US. It's a vast ocean of lava flows, and it can make for treacherous terrain. Elliot Blakesley was an Idaho native. She earned her BS and master's degree in zoology before earning her MD. She was a physician at the Snake River Correctional Institution, and her friend Amy Linkert was a retired teacher. The two were in their 60s, but they were active and familiar with the outdoors. Linkert's niece described the two as avid hikers and survivalists. On September 19th, they were spotted at a campground nearly 18 miles away. The two didn't return on September 20th as planned, and when Joe failed to show up for work on the 24th, her co-workers reported her missing. Their vehicle was discovered at Tree Mold's Trail, and it contained their dogs, cell phones, and other supplies, indicating the two women expected to only be away for a short time. Family members assured investigators that the women would not stray far from the vehicle or break off the trail. At the time, the federal government was shut down, but 10 furloughed park service rangers searched on foot anyway. An official search didn't begin until nearly a week later, 
canine teams and foot patrols joined the 10 searchers as the government exited shutdown. The National Guard sent two Black Hawk helicopters and planes participated in aerial searches for the two women. They spent 6,000 volunteer hours looking, traversing difficult terrain in unpredictable weather. In the summer months, the sun bakes the black lava flows and surface temperatures can reach as high as 170 degrees Fahrenheit. On September 25th, the search area was expanded and searchers discovered Amy Linkert's body two miles off the trail of the rugged lava rock. An official cause of death was never released. It was later determined that a storm hit the area around the same time the women had arrived. Only a few days after they were reported missing, another thunderstorm delayed search efforts. It wasn't until nearly a month later that they found the body of Joe Elliot Blakesley. She was two and a half miles from the vehicle. Elliot Blakesley was found near the open edge of a lava flow, and recovery of her body was delayed due to difficult terrain and poor weather. Her body was in an area that had been thoroughly searched by helicopters over the previous month. Later, rescuers determined that canine search teams had been within 200 yards of her body. One of the handlers recalls the dog pursuing a scent in the area, then seemingly losing or refusing to continue. What drove these experienced outdoorswomen to leave their supplies and dogs in their vehicle? Why did they strike out from the safety of the trail? This case fits several of the missing 411 profile points. The victims were well educated and familiar with the outdoors. Their disappearances weren't the only ones to occur in the area. Richard Willis Bendele disappeared from the area in 1996. He was an experienced outdoorsman who had undergone a recent divorce a year prior but he was happy and thriving. He called his mother via a portable phone after a hike and he told her his truck had broken down. He suspected that someone else was in the area and they had tampered with his vehicle. That night, six inches of snow fell. Upon searching the area, only two gloves and one black tennis shoe were recovered from Richard's location. When police discovered his vehicle, they found the battery could turn over and one of the windows was smashed out. The search party included volunteers on foot, canine units, planes, and helicopters, but Bendele was never heard from again. Inclement weather occurred near the time of the disappearance and delayed the search efforts. The cause of their deaths was left undetermined. The location of both Linkert and Elliot Blakesley's bodies were in areas that had already been well searched. Canine units could not find a scent for Linkert and they seemed to temporarily pursue Elliot Blakesley's before resigning from the effort altogether. Terrence Woods Jr. was a freelance filmmaker who was working for Raw TV a production company filming the Gold Rush series for Discovery Channel. The show followed David Turin as he explored disused mines across the western U.S. On October 5th, 2018, they were filming at the Penman Mine in Idaho County, near the ghost town of Oro Grande. They were in the larger Nez Pierce Clearwater National Forest when Woods disappeared during a day shoot on location. He has not been seen since. Woods grew up in Maryland, near Washington, D.C., but moved to London to pursue a master's degree. Upon graduating, he worked on high-profile British shows, most notably The Voice UK. He was familiar with frequent traveling and shooting on location. He had participated in previous shoots in the wilderness of Turkey and Alaska, and his backcountry experience was non-negligible. He had no history of anxiety or depression. However, friends say he was not excited to travel for this shoot. In the early morning of his disappearance, he texted his father that he would be cutting short his time on the shoot by a number of weeks. His father thought this was also uncharacteristic, and Woods provided no explanation. The afternoon of the disappearance, Woods was talking with a miner before excusing himself to use the restroom. 
A nearby associate producer, Simon Gee, said he had an odd feeling shortly before discovering Woods' headset on the ground. Worried the man had fallen off a nearby cliff, the associate producer approached the edge and saw Woods sprinting down the steep incline and disappearing into the tree line of the nearby forest. The associate producer told Woods' father that Woods had been running faster than he had seen anyone run before. A few of those on set tried to pursue Woods, but they stumbled on the incline and difficult terrain, returning bloodied and bruised. Simon Gee told Woods' father, quote, Due to my professional SAR training, I stopped running after him out of fear that he'd be further scared, unquote. Gee's story was further corroborated by a local woman. Woods left behind his backpack, including a camera bag, pens, over-the-counter painkillers, cough drops, charger, tactical knife, and stun gun. However, he had his phone in his possession when he disappeared. Woods was reported missing that evening, but the search party couldn't be mobilized until the following day. Canine units, ground teams, all-terrain vehicles, and helicopters with FLIR, or forward-looking infrared, were dispatched to search the area. Canines followed his scent down the cliff and through the forest to a road at the base of the cliff. There, his scent went completely cold. The search continued for seven days, but no trace of Woods was ever found. The search teams claimed that if he had been hurt or injured, they would have found him. In the middle of the search, heavy rain and snow hindered air support. On the same day in October of 2018, Connie Johnson, aged 76, disappeared from the same area. She was working for Ritchie Outfitters as a camp cook. She was 5 foot 7, 140 pounds, and she had formerly worked as a U.S. Forest Service Ranger. More recently, she had taken to leading tours through the back country. She was in the Big Fog Mountains area at a camp that was only accessible by foot. A group of hunters left her and radioed the next day. They received a response from Johnson, but couldn't understand her message. They returned to the camp two days later, and Johnson and her border collie, Ace, were missing. Upon the report of her disappearance, search teams were mounted on foot and horseback, with six canine units and aircraft, again equipped with FLIR devices. The active search was suspended on October 16th, 2018, but her dog arrived at a ranger station three weeks later. After he was fed and checked, they flew the dog back to the search area, hoping he could lead them to Johnson. The undersheriff reported that the dog had no interest in following any scent. No trace of Connie Johnson was ever found. These disappearances match several of the missing 411 profile points. Terrence Woods Jr. was well-educated with backcountry experience, and Connie Johnson was a former Forest Service Ranger. Both disappearances occurred sometime in the late afternoon, and they occurred in the same area of the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest. Additionally, search and rescue teams were unable to discover any tracks for Woods or Johnson, and canine units were unable to pick up a scent. These are just three cases of the likely thousands of national park disappearances. The missing 411 profile resolves no mystery. Looking for answers, we are left only with questions. For potential theories and additional disappearance cases, please visit the first video in this series, Missing 411 National Park Disappearances. Thank you.